So I'm going to be talking a little bit about resilience, but I'm not going to dwell too much on that because I don't have much time. But I really want to talk with you about a concept that I'm involved in. So since we're in a medical school, it's important to recognize that only about 20% of health is determined by health care. You think about that. So coined by the California Endowment, your zip code is as important as your genetic code. Now, do doctors think in those terms? Well, some do. Many don't. And this is a slide. I don't know whether you have a pointer here, but this is a slide showing the health factors that are involved in health. So at the bottom, physical environment, 10%. Air, water quality, housing, social and economic factors, you know, the social determinants of health, basically. Clinical care, that's access to care and quality of care. That's health care. That counts for 20%. And health behaviors influence how we, whether we're healthy or not, which is a lead in to the concept of resilience. Now, we don't get up in the morning and think, I'm resilient today, right? I mean, of course, we don't think in those terms. Uh, we may think we're feeling well, we're feeling healthy, we have some energy. Wellness is a cousin of resilience. It's kind of a snapshot of how we're feeling at any one particular point in time. Resilience is a more embedded concept. And I'm going to just give a brief uh, description of what that is. This is from... Uh, Jack Shonkoff, who's at Harvard, he heads the Center for the Developing Child. And on the left-hand side, that's the black box of, a, of an infant. On the left-hand side are the factors that impact the infant. Stressors, parents, genes, and supports, which are protective factors. On the right side are potential outcomes. So based upon the strength of those factors on the left determines what happens on the right, the outcome of the kid. You can have strong skills, healthy behaviors, physical and mental well-being, or you can have school failure, risky behaviors, chronic illness, and shorter lifespan. Some interesting data, as an aside, from last year's biological psychiatry meeting showed that in twin studies, adolescents who use cannabis compared to their non-cannabis using twin had less academic achievement, had uh, less income as adults, and didn't fare as well as, their, as the uh, non-using twin. So resilience, just to kind of cut to the chase of resilience, is the ability to bounce back in the face of adversity. It's not a trait. It's a dynamic process. And that process can be influenced. That's why I showed the Sean Koff slide. And there are some very interesting things that are happen happening in the neurobiological neuroscience realm. So this is a cover from Biological Psychiatry from 2019 uh, um, on an issue devoted to the neurobiology, the neuroscience of resilience. Some incredible things are happening around heart rate variability, immune markers, potassium channel openers that are believed to be related to resilience. So there are multiple systems that impact why an individual or a community has resilience. The natural environment, the built environment, the social environment, psychological systems and biological systems all interact in some dynamic way. So there are some questions. 
What does resilience bring to individuals and communities? Can communities be defined as resilient? Does enhancing resilience in individuals, populations, and communities improve the social, psychological, biological, and economic viability of a community? Can resilience enhancement be applied across different age groups? Can resilience enhancement improve quality of life? Is there a matrix or glue to pull a region together? How long would it take? How much would it cost? All reasonable questions. These are some of the individual behaviors that are intertwined, that are related to resilience. A sense of optimism, cognitive reappraisal, the ability to shift your focus or your interpretation of what's going on around you, active coping mecha mechanisms, social support, humor, physical exercise, pro-social behavior, moral compass, all of these attributes are factors that are believed can be enhanced. The Rockefeller Foundation in the mid-2000s put out a concept of identifying resilient cities around the world. A thousand cities applied to the Rockefeller Foundation to be considered as a resilient city. 100 cities were selected. And these are some of the qualities that those 100 cities demonstrated, which I won't get into, but they're pretty self-explanatory. Other entities have talked about what does it take to build a resilient community? Understanding the vulnerabilities. Now think in terms of northeastern Pennsylvania for a moment, because that's where I'm going with this. Strengthening job and housing opportunities, promoting equity, leveraging community assets, redefining how and where to build, making the business case, accurately price the cost of inaction, design with natural systems, maximize co-benefits, harness innovation and technology. So when I hear that Scranton, and then this is not a slam on Scranton, when I hear Electric City, that's something from the trolley car era, perhaps. But I think, when I think of Electric City, I think of, not so much these days, Tesla, lithium ion batteries, things like that. Resilient cities begin with resilient people. And a, a, a quote from something written about Benjamin Franklin, does private virtue beget civil virtue? And so there are some vibrant communities that have been identified. Nashville, Southwest Baltimore, Oklahoma City, Brooklyn, Queens, and Richmond. So this is my lead in to the concept. The Resilience Colloquium. Can NEPA become known as a community of resilience? That's the question. Saturday, April 22nd, here. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about that in a moment. We have five keynote speakers coming in who are national and international experts on resilience. Anne Maston from the University of Minnesota. Her focus is on multi-system resilience. Mark Holder from the University of British Columbia, whose focus is on the relationship of wellness to resilience. Scott Russo from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, whose area is the neuroscience of resilience. Paolo Bocchini, a professor of civil engineering at Lehigh. His area is on resilience and civil engineering. What's the environment like in a community that's considered resilient? And Sharon Larson, who's going to be talking on the population health of resilience. So I talked about the matrix and the glue. Can regional academic institutions be the glue for a regional system of resilience in northeastern Pennsylvania? 
I've only been here five years, but in looking around this region, I think the jewels in this region have lie in the small colleges and university, and there are numerous small colleges and universities. But they're all competitors. Do they have anything in common? These are questions to them. They have a deep commitment to their institutions, to their students, to their faculty, staff, and to their communities. Basically, to be resilient. They have an intellectual mindset to train and educate, instill values, advance knowledge. They promote leadership, sharing, improvement. They take pride in what they do. So the question is, can they work together? Can they form a resilience collective? Can they work with community partners? And these are the colleges that, and universities that we have been working with. This began pre-COVID. It went into hibernation during COVID. And we resurrected this project this last spring. But at the leadership levels of these colleges and universities, at president and provost levels, we've been engaging with them around this concept of a collective around resilience. And I'm going to describe that in a, in a couple of minutes. Resilience science and academia. Is it a new field of study for the 21st century? And what do I mean by that? This is a slide of what we see as the touch points that relate to resilient science. Beginning with what I've already mentioned, neuroscience, the top right, the psychosocial aspects, education, healthcare, ethics, philosophy, and spirituality, health, population health, and community health. All of these different areas are potential fields of study in a concentration area or perhaps a major in resilient science. That's part of what's being discussed with the leaders of these various academic institutions. And the medical school is obviously involved in this as well. And these are all the linkages that have to occur to make this work. So the concept is beginning with each institution. Can each institution become a community of resilience unto itself? Is there a spillover effect into their surrounding community that would promote resilience in that area outside of the institution? That's a project to study. We believe that there's funding that would be available for this kind of thing. On April 22nd, the five keynotes are going to be talking on their particular areas. They have the question in mind, can NEPA become a community of resilience? And then there are going to be specialized breakout groups taking a look at how does one build a community of resilience? How does resilience apply across the age range or in different populations? Um, lots of kind of very interesting targeted concepts are going to occur in the breakout groups. And that's basically what we're going to be doing. It's an ambitious project. We have some uh, interested donors coming forward. There is a, a federal um, grant, perhaps will be approved by Congress. That's questionable these days, maybe. Specifically on resilience in communities. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, you'll hear more about this. Hopefully some of you will be interested in coming to the April 22nd colloquium. Um, if you are, contact me and let me know and we'll send you an invitation. Okay, thank you.